Hi, I'm Jim Bones. And, um, okay, so this is a model of the Earth, and it's made out of paint and plastic, and it can't grow anything. And this is a model of the world that's made out of seeds and soil and clay, and it can grow a whole habitat. Think about this as a hologram of a whole habitat. If each of those seed balls contained all of the plants that you hope to reestablish in an area, and you spread that out over the whole area, you have covered in one application everything that could possibly grow. And nature will select what's appropriate for the sunny, hot places, or the shady, cool places, or the wet places, or the dry places. So, we can see that's kind of like a hologram, and each one of those contains the whole habitat. You can have as many as 100 seeds in the seed ball. That's what Fukuoka recommends to begin with. But that's kind of excessive. If you know the kind of plants that can grow in your area, just stick with those. And what you would do is the first year, make seed balls with those, put them out, see what succeeds in your area. And then the second year, you would concentrate on things that do work in your area. And the third year, you should get a natural um, arrangement because the plants will have been distributed by weather and birds and mice and uh, insects and so forth. So that's the theory. So if you're going to do this, you need to be prepared for a long-term investment to really see the, the results. Okay, so this is really about eating, right? And the seed balls are about re-establishing habitat or growing habitat, and we eat habitats. The main thing that animals do on this planet is eat. All of the civilization and all of that, that's just a crust on the surface of what we really do, which is eat. <laughs> and it's been that way forever. Uh, I mentioned yesterday that these uh, pictographs, which are maybe thousands of years old, of deer down in the Big Bend um, have been shot by the current residents, who were probably the descendants of the people who made these pictographs. So it's all been about eating for a long time. Again, how many have eaten there? Over at Los Alamos? Isn't that sinister Trinity Sites restaurant? <laughs> Okay, and this is about eating too, right? Because when you run out of land or food or water, then you take it away from your neighbor. And nowadays we take it away in really big ways. And when I was in high school, I was a real fan of missiles. And I thought I wanted to be an aerospace engineer. And it was really neat because sometimes they blew up and that was really exciting, like this one. And uh, during the summers, in my last couple of years in high school, I actually worked for the missile companies, um, and this is a Minuteman missile made by Boeing, and I worked for them one summer, and um, that's a Mark 12 nose cone, and it contains up to 10 small nuclear uh, re-entry vehicles, which um, uh, are designed to kill people pretty fast, and uh, at lunchtime I used to go out on the coast and eat my lunch that was right on the coast in California and in the headlands where I was were all of these shells which are called turritella shells and I had had some geology in high school so I knew their history that they were um, millions of years old and that their lineage of course goes back to the beginning of life on the earth like every living thing on the planet right now and I thought well look how similar those are to the warheads that I'm mating to the to the missile and it occurred to me that what I was doing was not what I wanted to do because those things were designed to annihilate life in less than half an hour, 5,000 miles away. So <clears throat> when I got to college, uh, and this is, I used to eat my lunch right down here. Um, uh, that's a Minuteman taking off from the Pacific base at Vandenberg. So when I got to, um, Oh, and there are the warheads coming in. So wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to wake up to? Yeah, they, they do what they call pattern bombing, a step bombing. This is so that if you have hardened silos, you just put so many warheads around it that it just destroys it. This is actually a mutually assured destruction. That was our philosophy for many years, that if we were attacked, we would just destroy everything else. We, you know, Russia and the U.S. still have thousands of nuclear warheads on alert. And we're not doing too well with them right now. So anyway, I ended up in geology as opposed to um, aerospace engineering. And uh, 
in my uh, junior year, you had to decide whether you were going to be a, a mining uh, geologist or you were going to work for the highway department or for the railroads. You know, the railroads own a lot of mineral lands, especially in the West. Or if I was going to be a petroleum geologist, I didn't want to be any of those things. And this man, Russell Lee, wonderful photographer, famous for his Farm Security Administration pictures back during the Dust Bowl, um, asked me to be his teaching assistant at the art department in photography. He started the first photography class. So I've been a professional photographer uh, all of my career. And I used to teach photo workshops. And uh, back in 1992, I was teaching a photo workshop up in the San Juan Mountains in Yankee Boy Basin. I don't know if any of you have ever been there. Beautiful wildflower meadows above Uray in Colorado. What's the name of it? Uh, Yankee Boy Basin. Uh -huh, and it's just like a half hour drive out of Uray, but you need a Jeep to do it. But it's beautiful. In July, it's the wildflower capital of Colorado, I think. And um, so I had a, I just, I had six or eight uh, photo campers, as I call them, working in this area. And I was way up the hill here with um, one person working on close-ups. And I looked around, and, and the whole group was coming up like five or six abreast, just marching through the flowers, just mowing them down. And I waved at them to stop, and they just came on faster. And I, I, I realized that... It wasn't worth the destruction of all that life to teach these people to make photographs that were really worthless. And uh, so I, I, at the end of that, decided I wasn't going to do workshops in fragile areas. And it's interesting that um, that was ended on a Sunday, and I went back to Santa Fe, and on the following Monday, I got a call from Kenny Ossible at Seeds of Change. Did you all know that company, yeah. Seeds of Change? They used to be here in Santa Fe. And they had seen a book I had done on the Rio Grande and wondered would I work with them on their seed catalogs. And I really liked working with them. That was before the Mars Corporation took them over. And uh, so I did that for two years. And then um, it was really neat to, to work with these things. Uh, seeds, I love seeds. I have forever. Because that's really, you, you think about the concentration of life that occurs in those. And their goal was to make really beautiful and nutritious uh, foods for people and to, as you know, put them out in open pollinated form. And uh, also the preservation of the, the living ancestors. This is Teosente, which is the... Teosente and corn have a common ancestor in the Oaxaca Valley that led to the evolution of the corn that we uh, eat today. And you can see the way the little tiny seeds have the beginning of the shape of kernels um, on a corn cob. And then this is um, Hopi corn that you see is coming right out of the ground. I mean, those ears, there were four ears that were coming right out of the ground. The, um, I've been told that they plant their seeds about a foot underground and that they are growing during the dry spring season and then they reach the surface about the time of the rains and they just go ahead and mature right there on the surface. Really beautiful. This is uh, chard. And this is einkorn hanamani. This would be the equivalent of that teosinte to wheat. This would be the, the living common ancestor of wheat. This is Richard Pecorero and Amigdio Bayon, and they're at the old seed farm down in, um, in the Gila. Um, and so the, their dedication was to um, grow and preserve and to put in people's hands the genetic material of the future. This is at John Jevons Garden in uh, California. This is a man named Kissian Ghani from Africa, and that's wheat that he's growing back there. And, of course, you can grow things, but you have to know how to process and preserve the seeds if they're going to be viable. So they were in the process of um, making, they're preserving the seeds from chilies and from tomatoes. And those of you who have done that know you have to ferment them in order to make them uh, really viable. Because they have their own uh, microbial complement of things that they need when they start sprouting. And these were, some, these were all the things that were going at the farm down in the Gila, the, the fall that I was, uh, was working down here. So this provided me with some hope of a way to um, preserve wild nature because if we don't come up with a way to uh, help people feed and clothe and warm and shelter themselves, 
without destroying what's left of wild nature, their only recourse is to do that. And that's what's happening around the world in the, in the wild forests today, especially in the, in the Amazon. It's really, really bad. So um, these are some of the, the wild things and native things that I had worked with for many, many years. And I wondered what in the world could cause a landscape like this to turn into a landscape like this or this, which is down in Big Bend. And the answer is goats, sheep, burros, horses, mules, and cattle. They are the primary causes of desertification in the grasslands of the world today, along with fires which come with overgrazing and drought and um, uh, general climate change which we're facing now. Um, so where's the ice? This is an interesting picture. You know we're used to the big blue ball like it's all one big blob of water. Well if you were to take all of the water on the surface of the earth, the salt water, the ice, the fresh water in the lakes and glaciers, it would amount to a ball about that size. The fresh water on the surface is that size and the rivers, lakes and glaciers are, are that size. I mean the rivers and lakes are that the little one. So you see there's really not that much water on the planet. And that is the limiting factor on this planet for life. And um, so Seeds of Change, at, after the, the two, first two years they were there, decided to do a book on the leading sustainable approaches to agriculture in the world. And they made arrangements to go visit Bill Mollison, the man credited with permaculture, along with John Holmgren, his partner. And um, we also visited John Jevons, biointensive, Agriculture in California. This is Carol Deppie, and she wrote a really great book called Breed Your Own Backyard Vegetables um, about how you can acclimate your food to your locality and how you can breed plants that are, are nutritional, that you like the taste of, that are pretty. Um, it, just a wonderful kind of symbiosis with plants. Um, this is Amigdio Bayonne. He's um, a Bolivian uh, Indian, a Quechua, and he's one of the world's leading authorities on the genetics of quinoa. And he worked with Seeds of Change for quite a while, and now he is working at the Tezuki Pueblo with their agricultural people. And this is Masanobu Fukuoka, and this is Amelia Hazlip, and I believe that she has the best adaptation of Fukuoka's um, philosophies that can be utilized and applied by people in the West. We don't, we have corners on our mind, we have not nice round thoughts, so it's really tough for us to deal with his idea of do nothing and don't interfere and don't think too much. So here is a straw from um, Io in Japan where we went to visit him. You can see that commercially they harvest it and hang it up to dry and you can see all the places where it's been, been cut and harvested there, it's, uh, it's kept in paddies where it's kept wet. And the primary reason for that is weed suppression. It, it isn't that rice really needs to grow in the water all the time, and that actually weakens it. Um, this is a, a industrial rice area in Io, the little city. And then this is his rice, which is really kind of chaotic, and often there are weeds growing in it. And uh, he grows his with very little water. He floods once in the spring to get the things going and then maybe late in the season if it's really dry just to bring it to maturity. These are his mandarin orchards. Um, his family has farmed this area for thousands of years according to the information about him and um, their principal income is from the mandarin orchards and from rice and barley which they grow on a rotational basis on the same, uh, same flat piece of land down in the valley. Um, Everything is covered with straw, no bare earth. And you know, this is really a serious um, difference from our agriculture where you basically have destroyed the fertility of the soil and you're just using it as a physical medium to, um, to fertilize plants in. And uh, this is some of the mandarins. You'll see a little later how, how amazing they are when they're ripe. Now, um, unfortunately, 
the people who work with him, his family and all, can't afford to risk doing everything by the natural process because some years it just fails. Um, so they do at some times use um, some chemically treated seeds. As you can see here, um, when they were scattering the daikon and the clover seeds, I'm not sure what those are that are, are coated, but uh, it would concern me a little bit just handling them. So this is in his uh, work shed where he conducts the workshops and where he prepares things for it. And um, he kept emphasizing the evolutionary spiral of life. And so this was actually built on that, uh, that idea. These are the clay rollers. Maybe you saw those in the, the other room. And this is what he pounds the clay down to the powder that's necessary for the, uh, making the seed balls. This is his seed mill where he separates the seed from the chaff. Um, and here are the seed balls sprouting. And I mentioned to some of you that uh, we were there in October and a typhoon had come through and, or was there the, the whole time we were there. And it had rained on his place and we were out in the rain most of the days. And we found these in the cement mixer that he uses to make seed balls. And it was just so marvelous that they were sprouting. I don't know if anybody can read Japanese. This was on a log in his in his orchard, and I'm sure it's some wonderful invocation to nature. This is the water crock pot for the workers. And here, looking down from his mountain toward the little town of Io, or it's actually a city, persimmons. This is a big old persimmon tree. And uh, close-ups, just heavily laden, beautiful things. Horse chestnuts. This was a mulberry leaf, and uh, he wasn't particularly worried about insects. In fact, he said they chose, they were the, the plant selection specialists for him. The ones they liked the best, that's the one he chose the seeds to, to propagate. So he said they were his, his friends, his, his allies. And yesterday people asked, well, what about if they're eating all of your things? Well, his philosophy was you just plant more for them. You plant enough to feed them and you because they're part of your ecosystem. And something is eating them. Everything is food for something else. He kept saying that. He said a source of food shows up, something shows up to eat it. You know, dinosaurs show up, something shows up to eat them. Might be microbes. <laughs> so, um, spider lily. Sumac, his place was just so beautiful. And in October, there were a few cherry blossoms blooming. That was quite remarkable. Uh, elephant ears. This is a loofah skeleton and some um, kiwis. And I'm not sure what this is. Maybe chayote. You recognize that leaf? There were lots of those uh, everywhere. And here's a ginkgo tree. You use ginkgo biloba. Such a beautiful, beautiful plant. You know, thought to be extinct until, what, 100, 150 years ago when some were found in the remote area of Japan, uh, China. Bamboo, wonderful bamboo grows. Look at this. Okay, so these are 50 foot high bamboo. This is rice. He's growing upland rice. You don't have to grow rice in water. More bamboo, beautiful, all kind of varieties. You know, that's the biggest grass in the world. Do you know bamboo was a grass? And these are trees that are being grown and trimmed and copsed, as it's called, for straight building materials, for, for roof beams and for posts for, for buildings. And it can take 20, 30 years to actually grow a copse forest like this. And um, one of the wonderful things he talked about was um, if when a child was born, the family had a three-day party, you know, the whole family came together and celebrated this child, and they made seed balls the first day for all of the food that child was going to need in its life, and the second day for all of the fibers and materials like that that you would need, and then on the last day, all of the trees and shrubs and other structural materials that you would need. When the child came to age, they would have everything that they needed. And this was a fish pond. 
fish or part agriculture was part of his his vision too. And uh, he also said he thought the the largest practical animals for a natural farm would be goats. But you had to really watch them because they will eat everything. Um, he gave us a lot of lectures on things that went way, way back to the beginning of time, beginning of what, he's a Mahayana Buddhist, and so time is kind of um, non-existent in, in that. And um, he tried to explain to us uh, his philosophy of the evolution of things. And the people I was with kept trying to break his philosophy down into, into Western outlines of things, and he kept resisting that. And at the end of one of his teshos or um, uh, discussions with us about his philosophy, he abruptly got up and left the room and he came back in with this stone. Does anybody know what that is? Have you ever heard of stromatolites? Stromatolites are a kind of archaebacteria that um, have existed for as long as we know life on Earth. This stone has been dated at 3.5 billion years. And these critters are credited with transforming our atmosphere from one of methane to one of oxygen. So we owe them our existence in this particular form. And that's really, really important. And he just came in and he put that in my lap <laughs> and said, go to lunch. <laughs> so when we came back, he, uh, he got out his paper and his brushes and ink and he began to describe to us his whole philosophy. In this, he described as the, the ideal home with the hearth at the center of the home. Here was a, a woman with a child and the father. And um, he said that the, the kitchen or the hearth was the center of civilization because uh, that is where we all gather. It's the center of our lives. And as I mentioned, um, eating is what we're about. And um, he had this, this great statement that um, the ultimate goal of farming is not the growing of crops, but the cultivation and perfection of human beings. So here he was talking about how all the different religions are just destroying the earth with their idea that we have dominion and control over it. Um, here he's showing that we are digging ourselves into a bottomless pit with conventional agriculture because we're destroying the soil. And here's a close-up of some of those. Here's the hearth. And the, this is the, um, there's a, you'll see later, there's like a, rod that hangs down from the ceiling and it has hooks on it and you hang your pots and pans and stuff over the fire which is right here these are the logs burning in the in the fireplace and here's here's a woman with the child and the whole evolutionary spiral of life as he envisioned it and here it was, this was a really funny one these are trees he really believes that it's essential that we revegetate with trees around the world he's talking about a hundred kinds of seeds for all the different things especially trees um, he says no uh, compost, no fertilizer, no manure. He really doesn't believe in turning the soil. These are the little creatures he talked about as being the Ichiban, the original farmers that actually do the work for us. And he keeps talking about don't think too much and don't act too much that we, we overdo. And most of our agricultural problems come from trying to do too much. And we get things out of balance and then we overcompensate on one side and then overcompensate on another. And pretty soon you have a completely wrecked ecosystem. Now this he referred to as the, the mountain of God nature. And he said we are destroying what we're seeking by chopping the top off of the mountain. This would be like um, mountaintop removal in Kentucky for the coal. Right, yeah, and right here, right. Anytime you do strip mining, and he said, conceptually, that's what we're doing to the, to the mountain of nature on the planet. He said, we actually should be sleeping at the bottom instead of chopping the top off. And then here he went out and came back in with his rice, his natural farm rice, compared with commercial rice. Mm -hmm. And the roots on this were really bad. See, they're not looking too good. The, pro, the actual productivity was half as much as his. And he had no chemical input. He did put some duck manure back in. At one point, he had ducks roaming around in his uh, rice field to take care of the excess um, insects and also to fertilize it. But uh, agricultural 
um, powers in Japan really don't like his ideas because they don't require chemical inputs or mechanical special machines to, to uh, plant the rice. <clears throat> so they built a highway right through his rice paddy so his ducks couldn't get to it. So he had to bag up their poop and carry it across the road and put it out on the fields. So uh, at the end of the lectures, he sent us back up to his, his little hilltop farm, his Green Mountain, as he referred to it. And even though I had had all of that lecture and understood a lot of what he said, I couldn't figure out where um, this edible forest was he was talking about. This is inside. You see, this is his hearth in that little hut. He would stay up there with his students, his farming students, uh, for weeks on end because he has a, a, a really bad leg and can't make it up and down the hill very much. But you see how simple it is, and I think they slept back here on these tatami mats. And you can see what I was talking about, the thing that hangs down and you hang your pots and pans and so forth over the, the fireplace. This was up above that, and this is where he had drawn in one picture the whole history of, the, of natural farming as he envisioned it. And so I was outside tying, taking pictures at the very end, and Howard Shapiro, who uh, had a, arranged this trip, uh, was poking around in the, in the house, and he said, oh, well, we have to go, we're going to miss our plane. And I said, I know it's here, I can't pictureize it, I just can't see it. And he said, well, come on, I'll help you carry your equipment. And I kneeled down in all of this stuff to start packing my equipment, and I realized that was it. This is all edible ground cover. This is sweet potatoes and daikons and any number of other things that he has thrown out there. And um, when I finally realized that, it was just, um, it was quite a moment of epiphany. Because then all of this made sense. This was all edible ground cover. This is persimmons. These are the, the vines growing the, the um, squash in the, in the small melons and the um, kiwis. And back here, more fruit trees. And it was just astounding. Virtually everything there was edible or a kinship relative of what was being grown that, that was necessary for that relationship. So these, I didn't make these, these were later. Um, but these are those mandarins once they had come ripe. And look at the abundance. No fertilizer, no pesticide, none of that. Isn't that amazing? And then here he is in that orchard in the springtime. I would love to see that. And these are daikon blooming here. See, they're waist high. Those are his root plows. You know, they're those big radishes, the big white radishes that grow about that long. Those and sweet potatoes are what he uses to plow without ever having turned the soil, having to turn the soil. And he just plants so many that he leaves most of them in the ground. So the um, daikon forms this wonderful compost tube when it dies and the plants on the surface find their way into that in the most nutritious place. And the same with the sweet potatoes. They're little pockets of really delicious soil. And here he is with his rice. So I came back to Santa Fe, where I was living, in, or uh, to Suki, and so I taught myself how to make seed balls based on what he had taught me, <clears throat> and uh, they're made out of mixed seeds, soil compost with all of the mycorrhizal components. You know, it's the the mycorrhiza in all of the algae and bacteria and all of the little proteists, we used to call them, they have new names now, but all of the little tiny creatures, the one-celled creatures and the little tiny animals like mites and so forth, that are really tilling your soil. They are the farmers. They are the real natural farmers. So that is what makes soil fertile. So if you don't have that and you just have the seeds and the clay, it can work, but it's much more beneficial to use the, uh, the mix. And this is just red powdered clay. And he recommended red or brown clay because it contains more minerals. The white porcelain clay is, is pretty much sterile. And bentonite, which is used in drilling mud, is actually contraindicated because it was deposited in a uh, reducing environment. Yeah, that is, it would sulfides and so forth. So it would actually inhibit the growth of, of plants. And uh, so here you have the seed balls with all those things made. And you saw some in the other room. And we'll make some here pretty quick. Um, so 
I put them out and watched them to put photographs as they began to break down with the rains. And pretty soon they began to sprout. And amazingly, this is a whole ecosystem. You remember I talked about the habitat. You have clover, you have corn, you have beans back here which are about to sprout. I'm not sure whatever else is in here. I just put every kind of seed I could get. Um, as payment one time from Seeds of Change, I said, give me seeds. I don't want money, I want seeds. So they gave me, there was their year old seeds, so it wasn't a big deal for them, but they gave me packages of everything that they produced one year. And I used those in my teaching and experiments and I gave half of them to John Jevons and he sent those to people around the world who had been his students. So that was pretty neat. But being able to work with so many seeds. This is Naomi Ash and she's the woman who was the poet and translator who went with us to Mr. Fukuoka. So she came to Tsuki, she and her husband, and translated all of the material that she had recorded in Japanese so that I could understand what was going on. And she was fascinated by the seed balls too. And then I began to teach seed ball workshops in the schools around here. The first was in Tsuki, and that was really exciting. And then uh, many of the high schools and, and middle schools in Santa Fe and the kids really love it. For one thing, you get out of class and you get to play with mud, but they really understood what was going on. They really, really got it. And of course the future's in their hands, literally. So these are some that are sprouting out at Tsuki. And the Tsuki Pueblo got onto this really fast. This is a Migdio Bayon again. And this is John Burnett from NPR. You probably heard him on National Public Radio quite a bit. And I don't remember this man's name. He's the agricultural war chief from the Tsuki Pueblo. And they're looking at installations of the seed balls that they had made. We did a really big seed ball event with the Tsuki Pueblo children. And that was recorded for NPR. It is out there on Living, Living on Earth. That's the program it appeared on. And I noticed that the Tsuki children were much more serious about making the seed balls than the kids in the other schools I'd been to. And I, I conjectured that perhaps their background, dealing more with an earth origin, made them realize they were, were handling Mother Earth. And here I am on the banks of the Rio Grande. We had a really big event there up at um, Pilar at the Wild and Scenic uh, Recreation Site. Had uh, many, many people come, made thousands of seed balls, scattered them. Um, this is uh, Steve Harris, a Rio Grande restoration that helped arrange that whole event. And um, we were trying to replace those white weeds. And this would be in the fall. We came back to check on things. And every one of those little clusters of grasses had resulted from the seed balls. So this is uh, Alfred von Bachmeier, who's now deceased. He lived in Tosuki, and he heard about this, and he called me one day and said, I have an idea for a way you can make a lot of them in a short time. So he developed the seed ball drum, and we will use one later for a demonstration, and it rotates. You put the material in, and clay tends to ball up. It wants to agglomerate if you make it wet. And at the end, then you would harvest it with this wire thing, and the small ones that aren't large enough would fall through. The big ones you could harvest. And this is in Big Bend National Park. You know, of all things, I persuaded the National Park Service to let me try this insane idea. And they gave me an old dump. They had closed the dump and covered it with gravel, and it was growing tumbleweed. It had the best crop of tumbleweed I've ever seen. And they said, you can't hurt it, so give it a try. So Jim Chase, my, my partner in that, we cleared that whole area. It was about a half an acre of... of uh, tumbleweeds, and then made seed balls with grasses. I had to use genetic material from the park. So they had gathered grass, sent it up to some place near Amarillo where it was grown out, and then sent back. And I had this wonderful big, big bag of, um, let's see, side oats, cane, blue stem, and sprangle top. Those were the three grasses they gave me. None of which really grew in the site they gave me, right? They, they were not, <laughs> it was way too... Uh, arid for that, but uh, as it turned out, they actually did succeed somewhat. This was my working area up in the horse remuda, and here I am inside the drum. It's really nasty, <laughs> hot work. 
I had put too much water in and so it had balled up. So I was scraping the sides. We'll probably see that a little bit later too. So it was supposed to be a three-year project as I described. And so I spent a couple of years down in Big Bend. And at the end of two National years, Park. I said, well, nothing's growing there. We're going to end your experiment. And the fact was that they had only looked from about a quarter mile away. They had never walked down to the site. They were too lazy to do that. <clears throat> so I pleaded with them to let me at least come take some pictures. And I made some videos, which are on a video I made about this, which is on YouTube. You can see that there. <clears throat> but it turned out that they were working. They just were a little too hasty. I put them out in October of 1997, and it didn't rain again for about nine months, eight or nine months. So there was nothing that could have happened during that period. <clears throat> but anyway, it was, I love that country. But at the end of that time, I decided to come back here to complete a project I'd been working on for 20 years about the different biomes of North America, because I photographed in all of the, the biomes of North America. <clears throat> but I went blind. I had two retinal detachments within two weeks, and uh, I experienced a kind of post-traumatic stress disorder that was also happening at the time we had invaded Afghanistan, we were invading Iraq. I had all of these horrible dreams of flag picks sticking in my eyes, <clears throat> really horrible, horrible things. And I have a friend, one of my photo campers, who was a psychiatrist, and he said, we need to help you with this. I said, yeah, you really do. And so <clears throat> the older theories of PTSD uh, remediation were that you would just go over it and over it and over it until you wore it out. And that doesn't turn out to be true. And one of the other alternative theories is that you construct an alternate end to whatever it was that caused this. So you can take control in your mind and bring it to a conclusion that you can live with. And so in the process of that, I had all of these other dreams and this is like the instrument that the uh, eye surgeon described to me. I said, what is it you... I was actually conscious while he was doing the surgery the second time. I said, what kind of instrument is he, you're using? He said, it's like the most miraculous Swiss army knife with all these little tools. And they're all in your eye at this one time. And it was, wow! <clears throat> so afterwards, I had this dream where this lion and this bear perform surgery on me to restore my clear vision of the universe. So, that's also how I learned digital printing because I could no longer do the kind of photographic printing I had been doing because I just couldn't see well enough to do it. <clears throat> so I went completely broke. I moved back to the Big Bend. A friend offered me a, a little apartment in his barn, a tack room actually. And so I've spent, uh, been, been there for the past well, since 1995. <clears throat> and uh, recently I've decided that I would like to do the seed ball work again. That's why I'm here. And so I began teaching workshops down there again. I did one for the um, garden club, and these were the best little gardeners. <laughs> and uh, I really love them because they're so inventive, and they pick it up right away, and they get bored with seed balls. And she started making seed snakes, and she was making a seed snowman. I like that. <laughs> they just have the best ideas and these are the adults that we're working with them <clears throat> so the seed balls they had made like we're going to and so um, my new philosophy about photography and imagery is that instead of just taking pictures of places we can actually reconstruct beautiful living landscapes these would be living heritages these would uh, be things that you could pass on to the future so this is the kind of landscape that I live in now and um, I have done some seed ball workshops in that area. The Park Service came in and, and tore all, everything out that I had done and they planted cactus. Oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so the last time I went down there to look at it, it was like it was all prickly pear. I mean, well, all right, I like prickly pear. <laughs> so uh, my idea is that we can actually restore these, these desert areas. Uh, this is in the Big Bend. These are called the Santiago Mountains. And on this side, it's still arid grassland. Over here, it is Chihuahuan Desert. It's, it can be that short of a delineation. And Fukuoka pointed out that all of the man-made deserts were grasslands before they became deserts. So trying to go into a deep desert and restore it is really difficult. But if you can work along that line where the grasslands are receding and bring it back the other way, help to regrow that edge, that there is some hope with that. But I must say 
Plants are quite remarkable. In this drifting gypsum sand, you can see all of this. Okay, and as I said yesterday, I'm going to get on the soapbox a little bit here because uh, there are some people who allegedly want to be our leader who are talking about carpet bombing the Middle East and turning the sand into glass. This is what we would have. That's Trinitite. That's what you find down at White Sands where the first atomic bomb was set off. And that's still radioactive, and it probably will be for another 10 or 20,000 years. And you know, we are not immune from extinction. So this arrogant attitude we have about bullying people around the world, we are not the only ones with nukes. You know, this kind of talk about preemptive strikes and all of that, that makes it really appealing for another country to preemptively strike us. And what does it do? Well, we won't go there. Okay, so think about that. We're thinking about children of the future. <clears throat> so there's a seed ball, not a very nice one. That's the one I like. But before it's too late, we need to think about uh, the ways we can improve things. And this next one I thought was really fascinating. This is in Vancouver. And this is pavement, pavement, pavement. These are the cracks. Somebody put seed balls down the cracks. This is the, you, if you look online now and you Google gorilla seed ball gardening, you will find that the kids of this country and the world are on to this and they are going around everywhere tossing seed balls and vacant lots and on this. There are wonderful little videos. And, <laughs> and they, they have adopted the term seed bomb, which is kind of a... <clears throat> I don't like that very much, but as long as they're doing it, it's okay with me. Okay, these are some videos. This first one is actually Fukuoka teaching a workshop in that shed that you saw pictures of. And they're going to use vegetable seeds. So you're going to see all the different kind of vegetable seeds that you could imagine. Here they're pounding the clay to make it into powder with those rollers that you saw. This is his daughter. has to be really finely powdered, as you'll see. Now there are seeds down here. They're um, putting clay on top of them, and then they're going to start spraying water. And then he's putting some, she's putting some clay on that. They've already wet them down. These are probably rice seeds. They're very small. And the idea is to make them clay coat in layers so that it's really uh, protective in a structural way. So that's the simplest way I know to make them. You'll see someone will have a spray nozzle that will come in and add water. There it is, see. And it's easy to make them too wet. And he comes around and he says, no, you need more clay. Right, he feels it, it's too wet. See, so he's adding more clay. And we do that too. If they get too wet, you just add a little more clay. You see they're beginning to make larger balls. Okay, now here they've gotten bigger. They're still accreting more and more. And bigger seeds require a, a little bit bigger seed ball. I asked him about really big seeds, 
<clears throat> and he said, well, things like walnuts and so forth, they're already in a, in a seed ball and just plant them. And I said, what about things like coconuts? And he said, just cover them. They're, you know, they're, don't think too much, right? That was it. Don't think too much. I kept asking him all these, well, what about if it's snowing? He said, no problem. Put them out in the snow. Just don't think too much. He said, nature will teach you what you need to know. Now he's talking about sizes and the difference in when you hand roll them and when you do that. And now he's going to talk about sizes, optimum sizes. And for, for my work, for the restoration work for grasses and wildflowers, about a half inch is, is good. Bigger contains more seeds than you need for any particular site and it's kind of a waste. So you could break up a big seed ball and it would cover twice as much area. And then he's going to show about how to distribute them. Right, he's going to he's lining them by sizes and then he was going to say, okay, you need to put them about one foot apart. Now he's just demonstrating here, but you know, you don't want them all at one place, scatter them. And um, in doing work with uh, people like the, uh, oh, the agric well, I, uh, agricultural people, especially government agencies, they want you to be able to quantify how many seeds per square yard you can put out. And you can do that with a seed drill, but you can't do that with this kind of process. Even though you could take a pound of seeds and know you wanted to put it on a certain area, you make seed balls and scatter them, it's done. It's, it is the same thing. But you can't say, I have one side oats per square foot. Uh, so I was not able to work with the government agencies. So here they put all the seeds mixed together into his cement mixer. You saw how that was done. <clears throat> and the first thing they're going to do is to get them wet. <clears throat> And they actually were pre-soaked in that, that container beforehand. Now they're adding water. And they're going to start throwing clay in. So clay and water. Clay and water. Clay and water. And you can see they're already starting to ball up. That's just the nature of clay. You see how fast that's going. This seed ball drum is not going quite as fast as it needs to, and that can be improved. So ours will not, they'll be made a little slower. And at some point they will put in some slaked lime, and I think that's to add uh, hardness to the seed ball, although it's something I wouldn't work with because it's so caustic. Um, and then toward the end, he adds a, a liquid concentrate that he makes from mushrooms, and that's how he gets his mycorrhizal complement into it. But being a microbiologist, he knows how to do that. And I figured 99% of the world won't be able to do that, and I thought, from having worked with John Jevons, compost does the same thing. It has all of the mycorrhizal uh, components, all of the little associates, he hates compost, though, because he thinks that's associated with tilling and, and that kind of thing. But to grow a small compost mound of the kind of material you wanted for your restoration would be ideal. And if you take the roots from the plants you're wanting to reestablish the kind and you put them in that, it will inoculate your compost and it will grow the kind of compost you need specifically for those plants. So I guess he's, oh, here he's adding the liquid stuff, or someone is for him. So that's his way of getting the mycorrhizal stuff in there. But that's way beyond anything most people could do. And he's going to add some more clay. I see some more of the lime going in. Now they're going to let it roll for a while and then they're going to tilt it back and forth to make sure that the, all the seed balls kind of bounce around randomly and that makes them much rounder. And these are not quite hard enough yet. So he throws them back in. You see he's tilting it and then tilt it back. 
Now I found working with a seed mixer at first that is pretty risky because if you're not really careful you end up with one big blob, a huge seed ball. And then you have to make pinch off little pieces and throw it back in and do it again. So that's why it was so nice when Alfred von Bachmeier came up with that one. Okay, now this is my adaptation of it. And we have one of these down there and you'll see it. So you see I put in some dry material, I added a little bit of water, and, and they just want to grow. You can see them. You know, once they get big enough to not fall through the net, then you can, you can harvest them. After which they're ready to scatter or store until you have enough to cover the area under consideration. Because they contain soil compost with... Isn't that wonderful? Seed balls help sprouting plants establish... So you can see the little seeds bouncing around too and they'll eventually get taken up. But look at that. Just during dry times, the clay also provides essential mineral nutrients the young plants need for healthy growth. So it is important to use red or brown clays with the greatest mineral diversity not white or gray clays. If you do not have a local source for clay, you can buy red powdered clay like that used to make flower pots. Avoid it. Y'all can get that. It's called Cedar Heights Red Art Clay in at Santa Fe Clay. It's really beautiful, very fine powdered, but you need to wear a mask because it'll cause you to have silicosis. Japanese microbiologist and farmer who told me how to make and use seed balls. He has been developing these natural farming techniques for more than 50 years to grow fruits, vegetables, and grains without cultivation, and to help restore damaged lands around the world in all kinds of habitats. While describing them, Mr. Fukuoka repeatedly told me that making seed balls is easy. Understanding the right associations of seeds to include is the difficult part. That's the key. Which other plants would like to grow near? So an awareness of compatible and uh, it seems to me that the best um, best list of kinship plants or associates is in John Jevons' book, um, How to Grow More Vegetables. It's a long title, How to Grow More Vegetables Than You Thought Possible on Less Land or something. It's, you know, it's a funny long title. I love that man. He's a wonderful person. Um, so that has a really great list of what put together and what doesn't like to live together. You know, a lot of plants are antagonists to each other. Yeah, and he was talking about the, the microbes. Of the power of seed balls to introduce plants and this is another thing. You must not use invasive. Right, if there's, plants, you could ruin a habitat in no time by putting invasive plants. To your and in fact, <laughs> um, they work at nature's own deliberate pace. Mr. Um, the U.S. Army developed a program in World War II to drop contaminated essentially seed balls with turkey feathers over enemy crops to, dis to put pathogens in their soil to starve them. So I, th of course you do that, that soil is contaminated for a long, long time. So this is one way you could make 40,000 of those a day with that particular method. And that, that's, that's why you always do that with the kids. Now look at this. This is called a pan disc agglomerator. And they're made to ball up stuff to heap leach mining uh, concerns to get the last out with sulfuric acid. But they make the best seed ball maker in the world. And you can actually make this so it tilts in different angles. And depending on the size of seed ball you want, if you tilt that, when they get big enough, they'll take themselves right out of it onto a, a conveyor and you, it'd be an incredible continuous process. If anybody were an entrepreneur and wanted to get into the business, you can buy these, you know, they're several thousand dollars, but you could make an industrial amount of seed balls. Now, I don't know if you want to go there, you know, his whole philosophy was small, but if you were restoring large areas, he said, take those aircraft carriers and those pilots and station them off the coast of the great deserts of the world and have them fly sea balls instead of bombs and restore those areas. So, you know, on a large scale, something like that, I'd rather have them doing that than bombing people. Look at the volume. Is that incredible? And they're pretty uniform. There, that's the thing. I actually had access to one of these for a very short time, and uh, 
Right. Okay, these are the mycorrhizal fungi growing off of the roots, all that net. And so this is without and that's with, that's a healthy plant with the... These, they penetrate, they actually go into the roots of the plants. There's a symbiosis there that's, that's incredible. Plants don't end in roots, they end in mycorrhizal fungi. So, I guess that's it. Wow. You want to make some seed balls?